Hi, everyone. Get ready for the How I Raised It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Ben Narison of Tenacity VC. Ben just raised capital for a brand new venture fund, Tenacity. So we talk about how to raise capital for a venture fund. We talk about deal sourcing, SPVs, building relationships with LPs, and much more. So if you're thinking about starting a venture fund now or in the future, this episode will be really helpful. Or if you are a startup founder, Ben shares uh, details on what types of deals he's looking to invest in. So he'd be a great person to add to your cap table. So tune in for that. If you enjoy this conversation, I would be personally grateful if you hit that like button and the subscribe button and leave us a nice comment in the comment section below. And then send us an email at info at foundersuite.com. And I will send you a list of 20 of the most active fund of funds. This is a great starting point for starting your own fund. For now, thank you for being here. Sit back and enjoy the chat with Ben. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Ben Narison of Tenacity Venture Capital coming to us from Atherton. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Excellent. It looks like a very cozy office or den you've got there. I like the, uh, the bookcase. Is that, are those law books or encyclopedias? Um, those are the collected works of Thackeray that I inherited from my father-in-law. This is a library in my house built in the twenties. So oh, wow. it's Florida ceiling books in a full circle. That's cool. That's neat. That's, that's awesome. Do you spend a lot of time reading or is it more of a, a decoration? Uh, I used to, it's harder now, but I still like, you know, every morning I wake up and I, I get a physical newspaper. I sit outside with a cup of coffee and we foster puppies. So whichever puppies we have at the moment, they'll sit with me, but I've read most of the books in here. I spent a lot of time during COVID cleaning out the library. There used to be just piles and piles of books on the floor. I've always been a pretty ferocious reader. It's just a lot harder now. You know, it's sort of nine to 11 at night is the only window I've got. Yeah. Yeah. We still subscribe to the paper Wall Street Journal and I, that, I do that at night too. I'll actually pour a glass of wine or cocktail and sit there and read the paper and really enjoy it. So good stuff. Cool. Well, let's jump right into what you're doing. What is Tenacity Venture Capital? So Tenacity is a $50 million seed fund, really anything before the Series A, pre-seed, seed, incubation, formation, the whole ball. Um, I know I've been an active seed and other type of venture investor for the last 14 years. And basically, I spent eight years as a seed investor, then six years as a traditional VC. For the last four years, I've been at NEA, which is the world's largest venture capital firm, traditional venture capital firm anyway. And, uh, you know, we, we do seed, but very rarely. And what I've learned from my experience doing later stage investing, by that I mean series A, Bs, and Cs, is that seed is what I really love. It's where I get to spend the most time with the entrepreneurs in the most formative and material way. It's where I can actually be the most helpful. And it's where I have the most chance of having some influence. I mean, I was just talking to a potential LP right before this call. And, you know, I was asking about what happens when things go awry and, you know, how much of a scalpel I take. And I'm like, there is no scalpel. The only influence you have with an entrepreneur is the trust and respect you generate with them. And if you are fortunate enough to get there right at the beginning, you have more time to develop that trust and respect. And you actually have an entrepreneur that probably wants to learn versus later stage where as far as they're concerned, they've learned it all and they don't need to know what you have to say. So this is my way to get back to doing seed. The thing that I love that I've been doing for 14 years, I've had some great success in. So I get to do it and I get to do it on my own. Are you done at NEA or is this running parallel to your work at NEA? Uh, it's a separate dedicated thing. I, um, uh, I, I guess I'm paid through January 1st, but you know I work with Scott and Forrest on this concept of spinning out to do a, a freestanding seed business. It is my fund. It's not, you know, uh, it's not an NA fund. Uh, and so, you know, but they were super gracious in giving me sort of a, a home and a place to get uh, everything I needed done while I was doing the work to raise the fund. Awesome. Are you the sole partner or are there, you have a... Well, that's interesting. I'm in the work on that right now. Originally, the plan was to be a solo capitalist, to be a solo GP. Um, but I had about half a dozen people approach me that wanted to join. And I said no to all of them. But there was one that I've been pretty impressed with in the last couple of years as I've gotten to know him, young guy who's done a lot of the types of things I know I will need. And so we're working through right now whether or not there might be a fit to have him in, let's call it a venture partner role, to determine whether it makes sense to have him then grow into a more traditional role. Interesting. Yeah. What, you don't have to name names, but what, um, 
what roles or you know activities are appealing about that. I think that's kind of an interesting. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it's funny when uh, when LPs asked me if I intended when I first started out and I said I was going to be a solo act, they asked if that would continue over time, and I said, well, I need some time to figure that out. I said, but if I were to find sort of a person that I believed I could mentor that I already thought was doing well, you know, rule number one is you shouldn't have an additional person unless they're going to make both of you more money, right? Mm-hmm. If one and one equals three, great. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's, it's just not useful. But specifically, I think it falls into three categories. One is deal sourcing. I get a tremendous amount of deal flow, but I'm willing to get more. I mean, you know, I used to see about a thousand pitches a year. Now, I think because of Zoom, I see more like 1,400 and 2,000 pitches a year, yeah. but I'm perfectly happy to have that number grow to 3,000. Uh, and so having somebody that's out there looking while I'm out there looking uh, has a multiplying effect. And I like that. And he's uh, he's got a good eye and he's done a good job of building relationships with entrepreneurs. So I'm, I think that's number one. Number two is The fund concept is a one and done concept where I put all my money in at the first round, at the seed round, and I don't reserve any money for follow ons. I don't want to be signal. I don't want to interfere, Um, but I will do later stage rounds, probably starting at the B uh, through SPVs, special purpose vehicles. Mm -hmm. And those take time. And, you know, he has shown a history of of being able to work with the types of folks that I think are going to be material to that. Because in a lot of these SPVs, you want people that add strategic value. So he can help with that and that can ease the burden and also perhaps you know create new opportunities with new folks. And then lastly, while the fundraising has gone really well and really quickly, um, it certainly would be nice to have somebody else helping with that as well. Like I, I like being a solo act for the most part, but you know, it can get lonely and it's like being a founder again. You know, Mm -hmm. it's all on you. So I think having someone that could potentially help raise capital, even if it's just for things like the SPVs, could also be valuable. So those are sort of the three legs of the stool. And uh, and in essence, I've done with him what I've often encouraged my entrepreneurs to do when they had somebody that wanted to be involved in the business they weren't absolutely certain about. I said, just give them a really, really difficult task. And Mm -hmm. so he has a really difficult task. And if he achieves it, then we're good to go. And if he doesn't, then we will, you know, the parting ways or finding a, a less permanent way to do business. What was the task? Can you share that? Oh, I'm well, he's actually, uh, let's leave that off. You know, we'll okay. it, that, I think I'm going to keep that one for, because maybe I have to surprise somebody else with it one day. Sure. 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 Interesting. And partly, I think this is interesting because part of the question is a little bit like how does a younger person perhaps become a, a VC? How's a younger person partner up with a a more seasoned VC. And, and so this is sort of interesting insights of what the more seasoned VC is looking for. So uh, yeah. glad we went off. Well, I mean, I think I, I have a lot of people that will come to me that say, Hey, can we have lunch? You know, I want to, and they have that question, how do I get into venture? And it's a, it was a very circuitous and challenging path for me. And I'm pretty much sure it was for most people. So unless you're going in the traditional route right now for young people into venture is interesting. It's basically come from a very good school, end up at a very good bank, and then get put on the radar of a recruiter that brings you around. And, you know, there's this whole process for becoming an associate. It's becoming very homogenized. I actually don't like it at all. But change always creates opportunity. And so that's why when somebody spins out or creates a new fund or somebody enters a new sector, opportunity presents itself. And so, as I said, I had about half a dozen people reach out to me when I launched this fund, but originally it just was not in my concept. But this is, you know, I'm a believer that Look, I've had, you know, I raised half my fund in the first 25 days of pitching it. I closed on two thirds in my first close. So that seems really fast since I was always told it would take a year, but yeah. I have a 14 year track record, you know, and it appears to me, at least from my talks with people like Cambridge, that I'm my four funds worth of time are all top 1% performers. So, you know, I get that. I'm proud of that, but I also get why that would give people the comfort to make a decision. So when I'm looking at people, I would want the same comfort. Like, why is it that I believe you're going to really be material? Why are you going to succeed here? And so the reason I like this individual is my prior experience with him in terms of he's raised a fund for somebody. He's worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and it appears he's he's done some SPV. So he's got all the right expertise. So, you know, a lot of times you just have to find a creative way to get that experience. It's like that old saying, you know, like, oh, we're not going to hire you. you. Don't have any experience. Well, how do I get experience if you don't hire me? You know, and venture, I think sometimes you've got to build your own experience or go the very traditional path, which is a pretty narrow path. And, and I find it quite frustrating. I was at one firm and I was like, you know, they said, what surprised you? And I said, I'm surprised that every single one of our associates is an ex-banker. Mm-hmm. We've got nothing against bankers, but diversity is important in a lot of ways. And cognitive diversity is certainly important. And if you've got 12 bankers, well, you know, you're going to have a similarity of thought that's not healthy. Yeah, interesting. Just on this, one more question on this, and then let's get to your fundraising. Um, 
you listed kind of the three things you're looking at at this potential, you know, partner deal sourcing, uh, SPV, and maybe help raising funds for the for for someone wanting to break into VC. Would you agree that maybe building up a, a capacity of deal sourcing, being kind of the hustler networker, is maybe the easiest way to kind of become valuable to a? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's your number one point of access. So when I started off as a seed investor. I was, I knew only 12 VCs. Um, when at the end of my eight year tenure at that particular firm, I knew 327. I made a very active effort to get to know VCs and to introduce them only to my best companies, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what weakens you is when you introduce for the sake of introduction, because eventually people figure out that you don't have a filter. So in eight years of making introductions, I only had two VCs ever say no to an introduction I made. They were both wrong to say no to me, by the way, but it was my fault. I hadn't got to know them as well as I thought I had. So, you know, the curation and choosing of exceptional companies to make introductions, it's mm. not about introductions. It's about super high quality introductions. I remember I went to, for a while, the VCs would like throw dinners for all the early stage guys, and, you know, as their version of a thank you for their multi-billion dollar successes that we gave to them um, or introduced them to. And, and one of them said, you know, the deal flow is so important. You know who does a really good job of that? Mr. Narison. He's never sent us a deal that wasn't fundable. Doesn't mean they funded it, but they never walked out of that meeting thinking they had wasted their time. And so that was a very important thing to me. I always told my entrepreneurs, I will help you raise your Series A if I think you're ready, not if you think you're ready. Mm-hmm. I cannot jeopardize. You know, I am the adoptive father of 80 entrepreneurs over that 10 year period. I can't afford to take the company that can't raise to somebody as a favor because that's going to be detrimental to the other 79. And it's really, really important. And by the way, it took me a long time and it was a lot of time and cash expense to build those relationships. I had eight years where I had basically an unlimited G&E budget. That helped a lot. Uh, So, you know, I got to protect those relationships on both sides. And it doesn't really help anybody to take an entrepreneur out that's not going to be able to raise and have them waste his or her own time and the investor's time. And it makes it harder on the next person. Do you have any good standard line for telling someone gently you're not willing or able to make an introduction? Because I get asked that all the time too. And I'm like, oh, I don't. I, yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. I've only had two times in my time as a, a seed investor where I've had to say no. And I've just had to say, I'm sorry, you're just not ready. This, you're not ready to raise a series A. Yeah. It's not going to work. Now they didn't agree, but they came back six months later and they said, you were right. We wish we'd listen. We would have wasted a lot less time, but yeah. it was hard. I mean, it was emotional. I think I was really choked up because these entrepreneurs really wanted my help and I just couldn't give it to them. And it made me very sad. I, I get very attached. Um, but, you know, it's like a parent's job is not just to do whatever, you know, it's, you know, you, you have many jobs and roles as a parent and sometimes tough love is part of it. I'm not a parent to my entrepreneurs, but I'm very paternal, whether they want me to be or not. I mean, I just, <laughs> I was an entrepreneur for 25 years. I, I love everything about entrepreneurship. I just, it's the only world I live in. I, I, there's only two things I care about entrepreneurship and my family. That's it. I don't have any sports. I don't have any hobbies. Hey, yeah, I read occasionally, but you know, net, net, if it's not about entrepreneurship or my family, I don't care. You know, it's yeah. like I go to parties with my wife and she gets mad at me 15 minutes later when I want to leave. And I was like, well, we're done talking about entrepreneurs and they want to talk about sports. I got to get out of here. I got work to do, you know, but that's it. I'm a very narrow person. I'm about this wide, but I'm eternity deep. Sure. I like that. I like that. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk about the show, as you know, is called How I Raised It. And so I want to get into how you raised your inaugural fund for Tenacity. Um, maybe let's start off with a couple easy questions. How did you set the target amount? And then were you going after, what What sort of LPs were you chasing? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Well, target amount first. I looked at my history. Like I said, I've been doing this for 14 years. Um, I wanted to understand sort of the most realistic pace Uh, Because at both the biggest firm I've ever been in and the smallest, you know, we had discussions about pace. And my view was, you know, you shouldn't have discussions about pace as long as you keep the bar super high. So I looked at my own history. Define what you mean by pace. um, Well, like how many deals you do a year. So typically, the model in venture historically has been you raise enough money to deploy it over a three-year period. Uh Right. Now, some fund, I've been at one fund where we were deploying and it might have taken us four or five years and they were worried. I was at another fund where we were deploying and it was going to get the whole fund would be absorbed in a year and a half. That's happening a lot more now, by the way. So because rounds are getting bigger and happening faster and companies are more exciting. So, you know, I looked at my history and I do between seven and 10 deals a year, typically. So I figured that since now I'm going to be a primarily a lead or a co-lead, I would probably be at the lower end of that range. So I thought seven. 
And I want to be able to raise a fund that actually can last three years in terms of deployment. So 21 deals. And then I looked at sort of what the average trailing size of a seed deal was these days. And it was about a little shy of two and a half million. So seven times three times two and a half million gets me basically to about a $50 million fund. Now I will learn over time whether that's enough. And if it's not, I'll have to change it. But right now I feel comfortable with it. I don't want to have, it's interesting because the fund has gone so well, I could obviously raise a lot more, but I don't want to because I don't want to have any pressure. I have plenty of pressure as it is, right? I don't want to have pressure to deploy more capital and do more deals than I'm comfortable doing. And that goes back to pace and keeping the bar high. Yep. I want my bar to be phenomenal only, right? Venture was not built to fund good companies or very good companies or great companies. It was built to fund phenomenal companies, the future public companies of the world. And there are very, very few of those each year. And I don't want to be in a situation where instead of 50 million, I have a hundred and now I've got to double my pace. Like it just, I don't want to risk that that would change my decision process. It's yeah. already hard enough to fight all the cognitive biases that exist in your own mind and in the world and just make the best possible decision. I don't want to add to that. So that's sort of how I sized it as two LPs, you know, um, and he was very gracious and offered introductions to their LPs. Having said that, NEA is a $3.6 billion fund. Their LPs are typically larger than I could accommodate. Uh, so, you know, it's a range. I have 30 VCs as LPs, mm. both funds and individuals. It represents about 17 different funds in total. Um, I have a, a very large slug of exited and non-exited founders in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. But I'm also having really great conversations with a lot of traditional LPs. So, you know, you'll find that classic, whether it's fund of funds or maybe endowments and stuff in there as well. Um, I, I have actually split the fund into two components. The main fund, so $50 million in total, yep. 45 of it is the main fund. And then I carved off 10%, $5 million, and created what I call an affiliate fund. This is AngelList administered, and this allows me to take sub-million dollar checks from younger VCs, associates and principals and young partners, mm -hmm. um, founders that haven't gotten liquidity, and people that could be strategically valuable to me. In fact, interestingly, the smallest check in the affiliate fund made an introduction to a founder that I have now issued a term sheet to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's if you're writing a check that's below a million dollars, you need to be able to provide more value than just the check. But I want to make sure that's possible. And that's worked out really, really well. And both the main fund and the affiliate fund are about 60, 60 uh, I'm about two thirds full in total. And I think maybe 60% of the way they're on the affiliate fund. Very interesting. Okay. Lots of stuff to unpack here. Let me just touch on that for a sec. That affiliate fund, is that, that's not a syndicate, but that's a proper actual fund. Right yeah. On yeah no, it's a, it's an actual fund. The terms are effectively the same, except for the things that AngelList, you know, does on top. Uh, basically the only difference between the affiliate fund and the main fund is that AngelList charges an administrative fee and there are no capital calls. All the money is called at once. It's just pointless to have to do capital calls if somebody puts in, you know, $250,000 or $100,000. And then I have to, you know, every quarter like, oh, you owe $2,972. So if you're in the affiliate fund, all the money goes in on the day of closing. In the main fund, I'm trying to delay my first capital call until January 1st for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it would just be, you know, called over the three-year investment period if that's how long it takes me to invest the money. Is, is the affiliate fund tenacity or is this called something? Yeah. Else? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it has some slightly tweaked name like Tenacity Venture Capital Affiliate Fund One or something. I don't remember. It's got a legal name that's slightly different, but it's it's all the same. If I make, in a perfect world, there'll be 90 cents of every dollar I raise in the main fund and 10 cents of every dollar in the affiliate fund. So if I make a million dollar investment, there'll be two line items on the cap table, 900,000 from Tenacity and 100,000 from Tenacity Affiliate. And is that even, is that still open to investors if people want to get in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can, um, yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, you know, I would need to understand why they're valuable. I mm -hmm. haven't done a lot of sort of over the transom stuff. Although interestingly, you know, so I run a site, www.pitch-ben.com. Oh, yeah. Where mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. entrepreneur anywhere in the world can pitch me a one minute video. And I promise them a one minute video response. And I was going through about 30 pitches one, one day and, and one of them was like, hi, Ben, I'm so-and-so. I'm an LA real estate developer and I really want to get exposure to venture. And I heard you talking and I'm hoping you'll consider taking my money. And I was like, 
that's a really creative way to get to me. Um, although, you know, like the thing is, I read all my emails. I watch the pitch bends. I even read all the LinkedIn in mails and emails I get there. So, you know, I, my attitude is I'm always willing to listen. Now, the nice, what I will tell you is, let's say you're an entrepreneur listening to this and you say, oh, I want to pitch bend. I'm going to send them this massive pitch deck via LinkedIn. I'm going to get it. And I'm immediately going to respond, go to www.pitch-bend.com and give hmm. me the video pitch. Um, so, but, you know, I have had people reach out over LinkedIn to say they'd like to learn more about the fund. Actually, I just talked to a, an LP from Europe. Uh, yesterday that had found me via LinkedIn or found me somehow, but reached out to me via LinkedIn. I was in London and I had a guy tweet at me that he wanted to meet me. He runs a traditional family office. And so we sat down and talked it through. He represents a very large capital pool. So, you know, no, I'm, I've only got about a third of the fund left and it's pretty clear it'll be oversubscribed, but I am trying to be really good about taking every meeting to ensure that I have the broadest array of people that I can choose from for the fund. Uh, for this fund, but also because I understand that, you know, fund one is about fund two, just like every round is about the next round for an entrepreneur, every fund is about the next fund for a, uh, an investor. And so there will be people that don't get in now that will be interesting for, for the next round. And that's true with traditional LPs as an example. Like, you know, look, when you're talking to these classic old school Ivy League-ish type LPs, the chance they're going to come into fund one of a solo GP that they don't have an existing relationship with is incredibly small. But they're going to get to know you so that maybe it's fun two or maybe it's fun three. These are long-term relationships. Like I got a 20 year yeah. commitment to this thing and uh, you know, it's a long game. Uh, just like I want to protect my relationships with investors by only introducing them to phenomenal companies. I want to build those relationships with LPs. Yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. Okay. I want to pick apart your LP pie chart a little bit. Um, you mentioned 30 VC funds and individuals uh, that work at VC funds. Is that just folks you know from NEA or like, were you actually identifying, you know, like a little bit later stage funds that do your sectors that maybe. Oh, it's a, it's a all across the range. It's yeah. all people I know, mm -hmm. but I, you remember how I said, when I started as a seed investor, I knew 12 VCs. And at the end of my tenure at my first fund, I, I knew 327. Well, I know the number because I used to keep a mailing list and I used to do events for them all the time. So I sent a note to that group of people and said, this is what I'm doing. And, you know, if you're interested, let me know. And it was wild. Like I literally got three major domo GPs of major funds, like tier one funds that wrote me back, you know, a million dollars is the official minimum said, I'd bet a million dollars on you. And I was like, this is the most successful email campaign that has ever existed. <laughs> I send it. emails and I get $3 million. Like that's awesome. Now look, does $3 million add up to a lot in a $50 million fund? No, but every million dollars counts. And what was more compelling, I won't name them because I don't know if they want me to, but we're talking about people that started tier one funds. One of them's 85 years old and mm. reminded me of that. And I'm like, well, I can't help with that. But uh, assumedly, there will be plenty of years ahead of you and then many heirs to benefit from whatever I do. So, you know, it was just really, it made me feel really good to see the people that I admired and respected and thought of as just like the original guys step up to support me. That was just great. Wow. That was a real look. And I guess, I mean, you know, I see funds all the time and who knows better whether to back a fund than somebody that this is what they do for a living. So that really made me feel great. And then you've got everybody from, so all the way from the general partner of a major fund down to an associate. Mm -hmm. um, I have plenty of people from NEA. They're great people. I love having access to them. Uh, but I've got people from other seed funds. I've got people from New York and LA and, and just all over. It's just, it's just great. I really, you know, I love the ecosystem and I think it's a naturally self-rewarding ecosystem. I would guess there are people that are in the fund because they want to make absolute certain they get a little bit of an earlier access than they might otherwise get to my best series A's. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fine. You know, like I'm not going to, tell my entrepreneurs they shouldn't be reaching out to funds that aren't involved with me, but I'm definitely going to ask them to give my people a little bit of a head start. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes that's the difference that matters. Got it. I want to drill in that a little bit more. And part of this is, you know, taking the perspective of maybe a first time fund manager, figuring out their strategy for raising their first fund. Did some of the venture funds themselves actually put in, or is it more the GPs? And, yeah, and individuals? Well, it's mainly the people, but I do have one, two, I think I have three funds that invested, mm -hmm. and then the rest are all individuals at funds. Um, you know, look, the, the first close is a very friendly close. Yeah. People that know me for the most part. When I announced that I was raising, so I did make, I wouldn't say it was a mistake, but I did something that was non-traditional. As somebody said, that was a little brave. Um, I granted an interview, an exclusive interview to the Wall Street Journal. 
So right after I decided to, when well, no, June 1st was my official first day, mm-hmm. the Wall Street Journal did this pretty material piece on my spinning out. Well, for those of you that really want to think about raising a fund, there's this thing called Reg D, Mm -hmm. which is basically that if you do a private placement and you don't talk about it publicly, you're protected in certain ways. Well, when you give an interview to the Wall Street Journal, that's talking about it publicly. By Mm -hmm. the way, one lawyer told me, and the reason all what matters is that you get an opinion letter from the lawyers that you follow the rules for Reg D, whatever. Anyway, one lawyer told me they refuse to give an opinion letter to a person for their fund because they updated their LinkedIn profile. Hmm. So, you know, a Wall Street Journal article is just way off the charts, zero opinion letters for me. So that means I have to do what's called a 506C. Hmm. Now, the only real difference, it's funny, I said, well, what do I do to fix this? And they said, well, you have two choices. The first choice is you do what's called a cooling off period. You wait six months and then you go back to market. I'm like, well, as long as I can talk to people privately, that's fine. They said, oh, no, 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 you can't talk to anybody for six months. I was like, that's not gonna work. I'm not gonna wait six months to go raise my fund and just sit around and, like read books. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, well, the other option is you can go 506C. And I said, what's the difference? He said, well, when you do a, a private placement, people can represent that they are accredited or what's called QP. They can just sign it themselves. I can say, I have the assets, I sign. When you do a 506C, somebody else has to attest mm. that that is true. And that could be a lawyer, an accountant, or an RIA, a, your broker, So I thought, well, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. Now, it turns out it's actually a little bit of a pain in the ass because people haven't had to do it in the past. They have occasionally, but I've only had to do it once when I've made an investment. And it really was irritating. I'm like, why don't you take my word for it? But it's not me not taking their word for it. It's an SEC thing. Mm. So anyway, that's a slight irritant, but I figured a slight irritant is a lot better than waiting six months. So that's what I did with that. But you know, I don't regret that I did the story because people that I knew but wasn't in regular touch with reached out. I mean, I had a guy come in that put a, uh, if the, the way I structure the fund is it's sort of a one to million, one to $5 million range for investors okay. uh, at a 1 million, 1 million is the minimum. And if you're a high net worth, if you put in $2 million, you get a rofer on my SPVs, right? Because I'm going to okay. offer up my mm-hmm. best companies for following around. If you're an institution, you need to put in 5 million to get the, the rofer on the SPV. So one guy that I knew for a while, and uh, but I hadn't stayed current with reached out and he wanted to put a million dollars in. I mentioned the rover thing. So he's putting in two. I was like, well, that's great. You know, so so I don't regret that I did the story. I mean, I'm I'm a promoter. <laughs> it's part of being an investor. Like you got to promote your own brand or the entrepreneurs don't even know you exist. So, you know, it was helpful. But I have a buddy that's raising a, a really small fund. I think it's a $10 million fund. But he also had to deal with this 506C stuff and so mm. we with each other a little bit because it's, I have, a, well, I don't know if I can tell that story. I have a very famous person in the fund um, who's really awesome. He was, let's just say he was the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world. And he's an LP and he's going to be on my LPAC. And uh, he's also going to give me office hours time to give to the entrepreneurs. Now, if I wasn't going to tell you the rest of the story, I'd tell you who it is. But the rest of the story is what I wanted to get to, which is sort of funny. So he wanted to be an LP. I said, this is great. I'm so excited. I sent him all the documents. He said, well, I just want to do it the old fashioned way. Let me do it by PDF. I gave him that. And, uh, and then we came back to him and said, hey, we need this accreditation stuff. And he said, I've never had to do that before. Can't I just say, quote, I ran fill in the blank, one of the world's largest companies? Yeah. And I was like, well, you can certainly say that to me, but I don't know if the lawyers of the SEC will agree. In the end, it turns out that as long as you can attach uh, something that makes it very clear, like when the guy was on the cover of Fortune magazine, <laughs> that, that that does work out for the lawyers to gain the comfort that they need to represent that he is in fact a, what's called qualified, uh, you know, QP. So yeah, and there's all kinds of little stuff I'm learning that is interesting, but none of it, you know, it's funny. Here's, I want to go back to the beginning for a second. When I went out to raise, I talked to a bunch of people that had raised new funds and a couple of people that had spun out of NEA. And they said, look, it's going to take you a year, but here's the thing. Just go ahead and start pitching people right now. Because it's going to take so long, you might as well. You don't have to have a PPM or anything. Mm -hmm. So I built a deck and I started pitching. And then 25 days in, I have over 50% of the fund committed. And it's like, uh uh-oh, good problem to have, but I've got nothing. I haven't hired a lawyer, haven't hired a back office, don't have a PPM, don't have an LPA, don't have a term sheet, have nothing. So I'm scrambling. And you know what happened? I went to all the tier one lawyers. I wanted one of the top three. And uh, they all said no to me. And I wanted the number one... Uh, back office provider, they said no to me. They're all too busy. I was like, Mm. are you kidding me? If you were one of my entrepreneurs, I'd be kicking you in the teeth right now. Like, 
not actually, uh, but like, come on, man, how do you say no to business? So I went to basically some of those senior, senior VCs I knew, and they went to the top people in each of those organizations. And I ended up getting tier one of everything, but it was amazing that I had to do so much work just to get it. And so then I did all the work to get the documents made. And it's funny because one of the people, one of the traditional LPs said, can you please give us access to your PPM? And I said, sure, the lawyers are copied. Um, they'll give it to you. And the lawyers wrote back, you don't have a PPM. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm not because I don't have regular protection anyway. I guess I don't need one. So it was just funny. Like I had Zippo and we did get it done. You know, first week of September as planned, closed two thirds of the fund. And, you know, so now I've got that last third between now and the end of the year. The reason there's still room is just, you know, the demand is there, but what I want to do is basically spend the rest of the year. So now through January 1st, and then allocate, uh, although I've changed my view on that slightly to where I'm just going to start onboarding people right away and then make the final decision, not for whether they can be in the fund, but for how much they can have okay. on January 1st. Because the first close did take about 10 days longer than I had anticipated. And that was irksome uh, because I was so like, I mean, I pushed and pushed and pushed with my lawyers. And I got the documents out exactly when I said they would. You know, so it was just sort of a bummer to have to wait. But I think when I got half the money one month in and didn't give them docs for three months, it, it sort of threw people off. So for the now process, once somebody commits, I'm going to onboard them right away. And what I'll do is ask them min max. And so the documents will be mm -hmm. written up for the maximum they want to invest. But come January 1st, I'll tell them what the actual number will be in between their min and the max. Okay. What, if you could boil it down, what, led this to be such a speedy round? Is it just your background or did you create some FOMO? <laughs> um, I think it just boils down to, I, I think merit, I, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for 14 years. My first fund equivalent, meaning if you take three years of my investment history at a time and follow the fund was basically a 14 X realized fund. My second one is five and a half X right now. My third one is six and a half X right now. And even my young, tiny little group of companies that are very, very early in is already at two X. So, you know, I've been told those are all top 1% performers for their vintage. I don't know it for a fact because I don't subscribe to the data, but I was talking to a guy from Cambridge and I said, I was told these are all top 1%. Is that true? According to Cambridge data. And he said, well, I'd have to look at the individual vintages, but it looks right to me. So I would argue that Top 1% performance, like, yes, I want to be top zero, you know, like I want to be top single BIP, but top 1%, like, it's funny, every once, I've only had, I think, two passes. Um, and they're both basically say, hey, I just, we just don't have time to work on this right now. And it's like, really, really? Like there are legitimate reasons to pass on me, but with my performance that you don't have time, Oh my God, what a bunch of lazy people. It's a frothy world right now. <laughs> I know, but it's just, that's just idiotic. Uh, in one case, it's just, and their letter was so full of BS, like, we don't want to waste your time and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, give me a break. I've been a VC long enough to know what a bullshit pass looks like. So <laughs> my greatest hope is that I continue to crush it so that in the next fund or two, I will admit I'm like an evil elephant. I never forget and I never forgive. And actually in fairness, of the well, two people that passed, one- did it in a way that I was okay with. They called me. We had a long conversation. I still think they're being lazy, but the other one, yeah, I'm just very focused on uh, making sure they're never in the fun, no matter what. Well, that's, you know, that's how many founders feel, right? When Oh, absolutely. Um, and usually I tell my founders, look, you can get mad. Don't let your money get mad, but you can afford to save one or two people uh, for the, sorry, man, I'm just too busy. Yeah, I know you want in. It's funny because they're, well, I won't go into it. But, you know, uh, generally speaking, I'm sanguine about this stuff. I know a lot of people, want, the legitimate reasons to not get there sometimes will mean you can't be there until fund two or three. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, do I expect the, oh, or, you know, hey, if you're some massive endowment and your minimum check size is $30 million, and I'm telling you, you can only put in five and you've got to make up the rest of it on SPVs, which should be easy. I've already got people that have, you know, I'm the funds not even finished and I'm doing two SPVs and I've got people that will have invested as much in the SPVs as they put in the fund in the first place. So I actually want to talk about that for a minute. Cause I think that's an interesting thing. So you, you mentioned it's a one and done. I mean, you, the fund writes one check into a startup and it doesn't do follow on investments, but instead does an SPV um, maybe just talk about that and keep it pretty basic for people yeah. trying to figure well, this out. You know, so normally in traditional venture, the model is you write a check for a dollar and you reserve another dollar or two to do the following rounds. Yep. But it seeds, seeds where you get the biggest multiples, right? So I shoot for 40 to 100x multiples on my money when I make a seed investment. If I do the series A, that's going to reduce my multiples. And I'm much more interested in my multiples than anything else. 
Great multiples deliver great IRRs. So I would rather, if I've got $2, put $2 in right away than a dollar now and a dollar later. If I'm wrong or if it doesn't work out, it's going to go to zero anyway. But if I'm right, that's where I get that 40 to 100 X. And I've gotten half a dozen of those at least. So anyway, so the fund itself will not reserve any dollars going forward. And the reason that that's different than traditional venture is if you've got virtually unlimited capital, then you can keep investing over and over and over again. But I don't. I've got $50 million. It's not actually that much money. And so I want to have about 20 to 25 companies in this fund. And that's the right approach for me. I also run my numbers backwards over the last 14 years, and it makes me the most money. So having said that, when my companies get really exciting and are awesome, I don't want to just sit on the sidelines. But let's say as an example, I've got a company that I put my money in it. I'll use a real company without naming them. I have a company I invested in two years ago. I paid the highest price I've ever paid for a startup. And I just sold my shares two years later for 42 and a half X my original investment. Okay. Now I did that because I want to make a 10% GP commit, put in 10% of the capital of my own fund. And if I do that three funds in a row, I will be well in excess of 50% of my liquid net worth. And I'd like to get that number down to 50%. So I'm looking for liquidity wherever I can get it rationally. But the point is, I still really love that company. And I think there's another 10 to 20 X from here. Now, 10 to 20 X is not my target, Mm -hmm. but it's still a very good return. So by doing an SPV, I can go out and say to my investors, I think this one still has a 10 to 20 X in it. Do you want that sort of return? Mm -hmm. And if so, you know, how much money can we put in here? Um, And I, I price it advantageously. So this allows LPs. And this has been a trend I've noticed over the last two funds I've worked at. A lot of traditional LPs want to do more directs more co-invests because mm-hmm. they view it as lowering their total cost and potentially increasing their return if they pick well, or if they trust their managers and their managers pick well, trust their managers to pick well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it seems like a really good fit in both directions. The other point is, you know, a lot of these traditional LPs, you know, I, if I'm capping them out, I call it $5 million. There's one and only one LP I'm considering taking in for more because we've got to know each other really well. Um, I really like them. I like the relationship we've built already. And I really like that when they do direct investing, they help the entrepreneurs and I'm able to prove that by diligencing them Mm. with other uh, GPs they work with and with the entrepreneurs they've helped. So, you know, if you can only put 5 million in and your normal check size is 10, I look at the SPVs as a way for you to make sure that you can get enough money deployed for you to care about me. Because, you know, it's just like when a VC talks to an entrepreneur, it's like if they're raising $5 million and they won't take more than 250,000 from the VC, the VC is like, you know what? How do I make that matter? Yeah, um, right. the same idea. Like, I want to make sure I matter to my LPs, and because I'm charging zero fee and ten percent carry, both of which I would argue are quite low for these SPVs. You know, it's like a thank you for the people that are starting me out. I mean, yes, the fund went really quick, and yes, it'll be oversubscribed, and yes, I'll have more money than I want to take, but and I will take the right amount, the fifty, not more. Um, but they still put me in business, and I want them to be rewarded for that. So. Let's take a real simple scenario, though, and then we can move on to something else. But one of your companies is doing well. You've already written them a $2 million check, whatever. Um, and now you've set up this SPV. And what would you typically be, how much would you typically be raising? And would you just sort of circulate it to all the uh, LPs and yeah. see who wants to fill it up? Correct. And yeah. I'll give you an actual example, because I mentioned I'm already doing two SPVs. Um, there are three ways I will likely be investing most of the capital for the fund. One is as a lead, the other is as a co-lead, and the other is what I call special situations. Maybe I got there too late. So I did a special situation about three months ago where I got there a little late, but I really liked the company. So I put in half a million dollars, which is much less than I want to, but I got the entrepreneur to give me a side letter right to invest up to $10 million in his next round. His next round was planned for $30 million. So it felt like it wouldn't be onerous on him, but it would be useful to me. So now... I take that $10 million right. He's getting ready to raise. I go through the deck with him, just as I'm doing with this. I use Chorus, a company I invested in, to record all my Zooms. And I then have a distributable Zoom that I can give to people a recording of him pitching a Series A deck, Mm -hmm. plus a data room. And I tell them, this is the SPV. Um, Tell me if you want to participate. Now, the way that works, yes, I do distribute it to everybody, including the people in, in the affiliate fund. Originally, I wasn't going to include the affiliate fund folks, but several people wanted me to. And so I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So first it goes to the people with rofers. You know, these are yep. the $2 million high net worths and the $5 million institutions. And that's they right up first year, just for anyone who maybe doesn't know the acronym. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. right yeah. at first refusal. Sorry, you're you're right. I should always I always tell entrepreneurs never use an acronym without explaining. Um, so the people with rights of first refusal get to see it first. They tell me what they want. In uh, I've got a different example where I've got a smaller SPV. It's about three million dollars, and the first person I reached out to wants half of it, but he said he would be flexible. So I've now reached out to the entire group of traditional LPs and affiliate LPs, and it looks like I'm oversubscribed on that one. So then I will talk to the person with the rover about whether he'd be willing to take, say, instead of a million and a half, if he'd take a million. And he seemed open-minded. I talked to him yesterday. Mm. And based on that, I will then go back to everybody else and tell them how much they can get. You know, it'll be, if I've got 6 million demand for 3 million, then I'll give the rover what he needs, but ask him to take less and then distribute everything else pro rata to the rest of the people in the fund based on where they sit in the fund. You know, so bigger... You should get proportionate to how you've supported me. So yeah. anyway, that's how that works. And, uh, you know, it, it can happen in any round where I either have the right to make the investment or the entrepreneur is willing to let me. Oh, and one other thing, you know, this is not just companies that are in Tenacity already. You know, I still have many great companies from my 14 years of investing prior and where those companies are raising. I'm already lobbying to get the rights to put more money in if I think it makes sense. I will not do this for every deal in my portfolio. I'll only do this for the, the most exciting ones. Very cool. All right. I won't keep you too much longer. A couple of quick questions. Any, you know, a lot of what made your round go fast and, and everything was based on your track record, but any tips you would offer for first time fund managers raising their first fund, just general advice, guidance, anything you got to yeah. share that might be more universal. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I will tell you that, you know, the I'm too busy thing that makes me angry. The only thing that I also don't like, and I get why they say it, but they're, it's an intellectually flawed construct is every once in a while somebody say, yeah, well, you know, you're a generalist and we really want funds with quote unquote, a focus. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. I was talking to an LP who asked me not to name him, but they've been doing this for 40 years and they found that focus funds underperform mm -hmm. generalist funds. They force people into a box that means they have a smaller aperture. Now, the one exception, crypto funds. Crypto funds have crushed. Mm. And I think if you were to talk about fintech, I don't think of fintech as a particular focus. I mean, three of the four deals I did in the last three months are fintech, but they're in total, one's in construction, one's in manufacturing. Like fintech is everything now. But I will say that certainly these LPs have convinced themselves that they need focused funds for allocation purposes and portfolio construction, whatever. Mm -hmm. The data proves they are wrong and then they will get less returns for it. Um, and I'm always fascinated. I'm like, so I've done this for 14 years and I've stayed in the top 1%. You want to know what my focus is? My focus is staying in the top 1%. In the top 1%. Until I die. <laughs> sure. How about that? Is that adequate? Uh -huh. You think that I would perhaps do better by changing from what I do to something that I don't do? I like that answer. <laughs> you know, but anyway, yeah. I don't say that because I'm not that big of a jerk, but <laughs> it's like, wow, really? Have you looked at the data? Anyway, now you can use the ninja move or judo move of using that to your advantage. If you're a first time manager, you got to have a focus, right? Because then all of a sudden they can shift their rationale mm. from your lack of performance to the focus area that you are in. Sure. Mm -hmm. When I look at people, like my performance data is slide two on my deck. When mm -hmm. you look at these new people, they like 16 pages of random blah, 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 followed by like no performance at all or buried in the back of the deck. And I'm like, look, your story's great. Show me the results. Sure. Um, it's very, very hard for me to back. It's not that I would never back somebody without some results, but like even your angel investing, like just show me what you've done. Um, so one, pick a focus. That's probably going to help mm -hmm. you Two. Um, even if it's only your angel investing or something else, it's certainly useful if you can show your ability to pick. Not, mm -hmm. oh, I met so and so, and I would have invested if I had money. Like, you know, did you did you do angel list? Did you? I mean, like, you got to be yeah. able to do something, man. Um, and then lastly, uh, understand that you're in the same game every entrepreneur is in. You're in the frog kissing game. Mm -hmm. This is a pipeline management thing. Yep. You know, yep. you just start dialing for dollars. So I have a buddy who I actually put a little bit of money into his fund. He is a first timer, but I really, there's a lot of reasons why I think he's going to do quite well. He told me he made something like 1900 calls yeah. to get to 93 LPs. Like, man, but that's the reality. Just like an entrepreneur, you are in the frog kissing game and you're going to have to kiss a lot of frogs. 1900 uh, calls to get to 93 LP meetings. Uh, so I think that's the number. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But, yeah. you know. It also shows his rigor in keeping track. Um, <laughs> these are like, traditionally, it has taken new people 
sometimes well over a year to raise their first fund. Yeah. yeah. I knew a guy early on before solo GPs were a thing. It took him like two or three years, but he is absolutely crushed. And now it takes him no time at all. So yeah. understand that you are in this for a, it's a long game and assume it's going to take you a year, if not two, if you're totally new to this. Um, if you're totally new to this, it could take two or three and assume that a lot of these relationships will take a very long time to mature. You won't get them for fund one. You're hopefully you'll get them for fund two and it might be fund three. Um, but, you know, you got to have a gimmick. So that's where you find a focus and just understand that, you know, th- you know, what's funny, this raising money for fun. This is the second time I've done it. Mm-hmm. I did it for one of the funds I joined. Um, it's just like my IPO roadshow. You go out and you tell the same story over and mm-hmm. over and over again. And interestingly, in my IPO roadshow, in my helping to raise fund two of a fund I joined, and in my experience, there was one person on the other side of a pitch that asked a question that I was impressed by, and it made me think. Mm. Everybody else, they're smart. They ask smart questions, but they're the same questions. And you have, you know, it's like when an entrepreneur says to you, that's a great question. I have a slide for that. Mm. You're like, oh, I asked the same question everybody else did. I don't need to ask novel questions, but I like when people ask me questions that either make me think or remind me of a learning I had. And you remember I said, I've got one LP I'm considering at a larger than $5 million check. He's that guy, the guy that when we did the deep diligence where they dug into my data room, they had 24 questions. And most of them reminded me of things I had learned at the time. Mm -hmm. So it showed me how really cogent they are on the category. I love the idea that I might have an LP that I can learn from where their involvement with other funds will teach me things when I ask them. So, uh, but man, it is a, I was very fortunate, but I, I'd say that I was fortunate that I spent 14 years getting ready to do this. Sure. And then it only took a month to get half the fund raised, right? <laughs> um, assumably, most people going out, I'm a, I'm a new fund, but I'm not a new investor, right? I'm not even a new manager. Like I've been a GP of another fund before. It's not mm-hmm. like I'm learning the realities of a fund um, or the realities of being an investor. And you're going to have to learn both of those. If you're totally new, you've got investor learnings ahead of you, but you've also got fund reality learnings ahead of you. And I'm not talking about, you know, portfolio construction. I know a lot of people care about that a lot. It's funny. I was talking to a buddy once about this because I I obsessed about it for a short period of time early in my career. And I said, have you ever seen a perfectly constructed venture fund in terms of portfolio construction? I did once, once ever, I saw a perfectly constructed venture fund portfolio. And I said, really, how did they do? He said, it's the worst performing fund I've ever seen. (laughs) But it was, you know, like I want to win the race. If my car has six tires instead of four, whatever, you know, like keep it in the top 1%. <laughs> I've never spent any time worrying about portfolio construction. I have worried a lot about what I do well and what I don't do well and the types of companies I want to fund and the types of founders I want to fund. And in fairness, you know, I say I'm a generalist. I don't invest in certain things. I don't do med tech. I don't do security and I don't do core IT infrastructure. Med tech and security need deep, deep knowledge um, that I'm not willing to go gain. And core IT infrastructure, I don't enjoy. So, you know, I don't like to be in businesses that don't excite me and that bore me, Uh, even though I know they're great returners, but you know, it's like, you can't do everything. And I don't do everything. I have swim lanes, FinTech's a big focus, marketplaces are a big focus, consumer and mobile, but you know, I do a little bit of gaming. I do a little bit of health tech, which is different than med tech. You know, I have a a nursing marketplace that's awesome. I have a Omada Health, which is awesome. So got it. Okay, just be prepared for a long slog. And just like, it's the same, look, my firm is named Tenacity for a reason. Tenacity is what it takes for entrepreneurs to succeed. And it's what it's going to take for you as a new fund manager to succeed because you're an entrepreneur now. It's yeah. nice. It's like the first time anybody's ever paid for my meals. I'm usually the guy paying for meals. Like, oh, no, no, you're a founder raising money now. I'm like, I love that. I love being <laughs> on the other side again. I was an entrepreneur for 25 years. This is what I do. I really enjoy it. It's really great. I'd forgotten that there are fun parts of it, even though, Part of the fun part is just navigating the part that's really not that fun. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Awesome. All right, well, I think I've kept you enough. If people want to learn more, uh, is it tenacityvc.com or what's the... Um... Yeah, we got a bunch of names. Right now, it, it, the site's not set up yet. So okay. yes, we registered tenacityventurecapital.com. But for now, just look for Ben Narison at LinkedIn. Um, or if you're an entrepreneur and you want to pitch me, go to www.pitch-ben.com pitch or hit me up on Twitter. I also take DMs over Twitter. I try to make as many ways possible for people to reach me and I do read all of it. By the way, if I don't respond, it's not because I didn't read it. It's because it wasn't a fit. Got it. That's a good, good point. And just to summarize, fintech, mobile, marketplaces, little gaming, little consumer, 
you lead, you co-lead, um, and stage pretty agnostic. It sounds like too seed, pre-seed, formation stage, kind of early, early stage, basically pre-series yep. A. Yep. Anything before the A. Uh, I'm about sixty percent enterprise, forty percent consumer. Uh, I do love fintech. I do love marketplaces, and you know, I'm looking fundamentally for entrepreneurs that make me say, "Wow." You know, I want an idea that grabs me by the throat as soon as I hear it. And then I need five things to make an investment. People, 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 a great idea and a huge market if it works. It's got to be big. It's got to have uncapped upside. It's got to be a future public company if things go right. I am not interested in investing in M&A outcomes. If I can avoid it, I'll be wrong plenty. And sometimes those work out really well, but that's not my game. I don't want to tuck in. I don't want to have to outthink that Salesforce doesn't have this. So if you build this, they'll buy you for $300 million. Look, you know, I, I don't need billion dollar outcomes. I need multi-billion dollar outcomes. So I want to find the best entrepreneurs in the world with the best ideas, even if they're just starting to become that. You know, you don't have to have a history. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you went to school. I care that you're smart, driven, tenacious, and have a great idea and a huge market ahead of you. Awesome. I love it. Perfect way to conclude. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure to, to see and speak with you. And uh, congrats and good luck. Maybe we'll send some deals your way at some point. Awesome. Absolutely. And thank you for having me on. Take care. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye.